Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so you and I came to know each other a few years back when we were both students at the at MIT. Um, and uh, I want to thank you first for joining me. What I think is going to be a really interesting conversation. So um, I have come to know you as a as a as a multifaceted individual. So you're somebody who designs prosthetic devices. You work with young people on innovation. You design your own clothes. You make music. Um, so let's. Let's start at the beginning. Tell me what kind of a kid you were. <laughs> um, I think I was probably a kid who found out what the rules were and learned to break them. So <laughs> I, 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 thinking back, I think I, I kind of knew that um, if I wanted to go out, if I tell my parents I'm going to study, it was OK. But then I knew I wanted to play football and play TV games with my friends, Hamzu and others. And so as long as I brought books, it meant I was in line. Mm -hmm. But then I was actually studying for a little bit, five minutes, and playing games the whole time. <laughs> and so I think it was more that um, I tried to figure out what the rules were, and then you break them responsibly. So you're, okay, so, so you're saying, and your mom is here, uh, you're, you're saying that you use studying as a guise for rule breaking and playing around. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so as you were breaking the rules, did you um, look to anybody as a particular mentor or, or guide to I you? Think, I think perhaps um, maybe I thought my parents didn't know, they probably knew when they were just giving me the leeway to kind of explore and, 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 and push those boundaries a little bit. And one of the ways in which then it was breaking the rules um, that they allowed me to do was to mentor one of my uncles who was a surgeon in Sierra Leone, perhaps the best surgeon, Dr. Boima. Somewhere around uh, 9, 10, I started shadowing him mm -hmm. um, and actually would go on and do surgeries with him and dress up like him. He's not that tall, so. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll wear his clothes, and that meant actually going uh, to do surgeries in Freetown, travel with him to Bo, where he'll see patients, travel to his village, and all of that, and he'll teach me as if I was a colleague. Um, and that, that was, he was a very instrumental person in my life, and I thought I'll grow up to be a doctor like him. He probably thought I'll do that too. So tell me about some of the experiences in theater with him. I know that you, you spend a lot of time in there. So there were amazing things where he would open up somebody's uh, stomach and tell me what he was doing there, or he would be looking for something inside the body, and he would try to explain that to me. Mm -hmm. um, but one really, I suppose, tough experience was there was a patient we had to see, but we didn't have a scanner in the hospital. This was in Bo. And we had this long conversation about why he wasn't going to do the surgery, because he didn't know what he was going to see in there. And so he decided to... Um, not do the surgery, but had a conversation with me and this lady about how, because there wasn't this kind of, he wasn't sure what the outcome would be, and he would rather let this person go. And it, it was really, really strong with me, and kind of was the moment I decided that maybe I didn't want to do medicine, that I wanted to become a bioengineer that perhaps focused on health technologies. Okay, so, so following that thread up to the present, your PhD work at the MIT Media Lab focuses on the design of comfortable prosthetic um, sockets. Can, can you tell us a little bit about um, kind of how you got interested in, in this topic to begin with? The prosthetic sockets is that interface in which the, the residual limb sits. Um, and it's, it's really essential because it's the part that connects your body to the prosthesis. And if it is not comfortable, um, you, 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 you really wouldn't use your prosthesis. And in Sierra Leone, before I left to come to do my undergrad here, um, I had phoned up a mentor here, Paul Bottino, and had this conversation about entrepreneurship and innovation. And he told me that I should go and talk to um, um, patients uh, who were in Sierra Leone. And they had been given free prosthesis, but they weren't using them. I soon found out that it was because it was very uncomfortable. And so I came then, having that experience with Dr. Boima, and having gone out um, and spoken to patients, um, and it was clear why they weren't using their prosthesis, not because they wanted to beg, but because it was uncomfortable and they wouldn't use them anyway. Okay. Um, and, and that was why I kind of wanted to do uh, bioengineering. Okay, so tell us about what you did to kind of solve that problem. The, the design that you have is new, it's unique, so tell us why. Right, so conventionally, the way those prosthetic sockets are designed, even in America, my professor is a double amputee himself, and um, when I came to do my undergrad, um, 
at Harvard, actually, I wanted to do prosthetics work. I wanted to build a prosthetic spine so that people can come and change their prosthesis. But my professor then, who was my mentor, did not do that kind of stuff. So he told me I should work on TV vaccines, which I did. But as I left and wasn't really sure what I was going to do with my life, I got to meet um, Hugh. And he told me that, one, the design that I had wasn't going to work. And two, even he himself was in pain. And so it was a universal problem, um, a challenge for people, whether you went Sierra Leone or not. And part of the reason is how it is designed. As a patient, you go to a prosthetist. The prosthetic takes your leg, squeezes on your leg, and see how is that? Is it comfortable? You're like, yeah, sure. Uh, what about that? And then they modify the positive mold. And then based on that, it creates a test socket for you. And then based on the experience, you go and you walk on it. And then you come back and say, nah, it was uncomfortable. And you do this. You get the picture very non-repeatable, -repeat does not use quantitative data, leads to a lot of pressure sores and blisters because we're using carbon fiber socket. Our body is multi-material, the design is not. And so my work is in, in collaboration with a lot of people um, and we create a multi-material 3D printed prosthesis using MRI and modeling. And one of my collaborators, Kevin Mormon, uh, developed this model, this modeling framework, uh, open source toolkit that we use that allows us to go from MRI to modeling and understanding those soft tissue properties that then tell us what the shape and material properties should be. So it's a global challenge and we're trying to develop this framework that anybody anywhere can send an image, set of data, you press play and kind of have a 3D printable uh, file that you can pick up anywhere. Okay, so just to make sure I understand this, you've um, designed a method by which you can take data from somebody using an MRI and through a set of modeling processes actually 3D print a socket that's hard in some places, soft in others, so that it's comfortable to wear. That's correct. Okay. So I guess in the image that you see, the colorful one with the nodes, that's a model, or that's a socket, there's an image of a socket file. And the colorful thing that the person is wearing, that's actually Hugh wearing the socket, which he has one. And each material there is a different color. Um, and that's a, an example of a multi-material socket that's been printed and tested by patients. Okay, awesome. That's pretty cool. Um, so, so changing topics just a bit, as you mentioned, you're from Sierra Leone. I have observed you to be somebody who's a fierce defender and supporter and also critic of your country. So maybe let's start um, by focusing on the things that you love about Sierra Leone. Tell us about them. So I, I, I love Freetown and Sierra Leone and I'm from Bo. I love Sierra Leone a lot and it's, it's a part that represents me and it influences my designs of the clothing because it's batik and all. And part of the reason is it's just, I, I like the smell, it's alive, it's very open and welcoming to everybody. I like the sound and, and, and it's, it's, it's very alive at night. You can walk around at 2 a.m. and feel like you were in a place that was rich and it's, it's home. It's, it's really um, a place where you can't be a foreigner, you can't be a stranger. You arrive and people are welcoming and you feel like you're part of them. Cool. And so by the same sort of by the same token, I've heard you express frustrations about the relationships between kind of international aid agencies um, and, and your country. What are some of those frustrations? Tell us about them. So I, I suppose because of the history, some of which uh, Clay had mentioned, um, uh, it's, what, what, what happens is, is, is there's this learned dependency. And during the war, people will literally come and pay young people to attend conferences, to go and learn workshops. And so there's this learned dependency, and this is outside my house. I, I, I spoke about the Media Lab, a place where we can all dream and a place where we can all do the, the, the invent the future. But this is what I see outside my house in Bo every day, and it literally says, if we want to have development, we need to call action aid, or maybe world vision. And so we have this generation of young people who what they do is write grants that say sustainable development and uh, what, what are the words? Sensitization, mobilization. Uh, mobilization, whatever those words are, you learn to put them in a, in a grant proposal, and that's what development is. Mm -hmm. um, that leads to this low self-efficacy and the generation of young people who are then looking for, uh, 
to other people from the outside to come and help. Okay, so in, when you were in high school, you and some friends of yours started an organization called Global Minimum, That's um, correct. whose aim is to help young people solve problems in their own communities. Tell us about um, some of the young participants that you've encountered through that right. work. Right, so we, we've done this now for three years in Sierra Leone, Kenya, and South Africa, where we think the model of development should be changed. If we, we can't talk about national development if it does not start and use the young people. But that means we don't just go in We'll put them in a room and have them uh, learn uh, mobilization techniques, but it means we actually have to challenge them to think about the, cha the, the things in their community and how to solve them. They don't know how to solve it yet, but young people are creative enough, they, they need the confidence, and you have to give them the platform, the tools, and the space, and the mentorship within which they can problem solve. Many, many examples across those three countries, one of my favorite is Mohammed Hadin. So I spoke to him yesterday. He's studying at one of those centers of excellence that was referred to earlier, the African Leadership Academy. Uh, he kind of stalked me on Facebook, knew I was going home, wait for me, waited for me at my church, and I, the minute I came out, I was like, hey, David, I, I, I want you to be my mentor. I want to make robots. Brought him over to hang out with us a little bit. Saw the Google Glass, that's his own iteration of it, makes a product that he wants to use, which is he calls the reading glasses, which he made for himself and his colleagues, um, so that he can read at night when there's no power. He did not need me to go and do that for him. He did that all by himself. And he now today, before he left, mentored lots of other young people um, with, with the fellows that we had in Sierra Leone. Um, who were university students as well, and started the innovation lab at one of their schools and have kind of pushed many more young people to work with them. The young lady in, in, in who's, who's um, on your right um, or on your left is, uh, is uh, Tracy, and she's from Kenya, and she's working with MIT Media Lab PhD students to develop sensors um, that will detect human, uh, humans who come to poach elephants. Now, he's not going to wait for other people to come do that. So there are tons and tons of examples like this. So all of this is happening, and then Ebola hits. Um, and um, let's talk first about the impact of that health crisis on young people. Um, so in Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, schools are closed. Lessons are being broadcast on the radio, maybe. Um, it doesn't seem like it's, it's sort of uh, meeting the need, necessarily. So Global Minimum launched a kind of hack at home challenge. Can you describe why, what that is, why you guys launched that? So, so we want the world to continue with the interest that they have in, in this region, and it's a global crisis. We all need to step up to fight it. But we shouldn't do the same mistake again. We shouldn't create this dependency in our solutions that we present forward. We should figure out ways in which people like Mo Hadin, people like the kids who are in Sierra Leone are also participating. In a, in a, I think I find it almost ridiculous that in a world where we know that there is data, people have access to data, in a world where we know that there are the tools available, we can sit back and see probably an entire generation in this region not have access to school, right? Now, this is a huge opportunity to think about the future and how we can bring learning and education to an entire generation um, in, a, in, a, in a really creative way, besides sitting back and giving them mathematics lessons on the radio. It's a great start. One of the things that's really, I think, telling is that there are hackathons everywhere. We support them, I support them, I participate in them, in NYU, Boston, wherever. They are everywhere but Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. That is not fly, and I don't think we should endorse that. And I think the things that we do, where we do it, must start with the young people who are in these countries. And as was mentioned, they are willing, right? I am one of them. Mohadin is one of them. So tell us about like one of the design challenges that you've issued. Right. So I, I guess I did not actually talk about the hackathon at all. Question. But 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 the the hackathon uh, is a series of design challenges. Uh, I think the last for two weeks each, that the young people, we meet them where they are, they're hanging out on Facebook and WhatsApp these days, um, and on the radio, and some, we have fellows who go to meet people um, in their homes. One of the challenges was to come up with your own story about, about Ebola. Um, otherwise, all the stories we read are from others, from the people from outside, which is good again, like I said, but we want to not always be telling the other story. How do we enable the young people to do that? And one of my favorite examples is this kid, Hassan Soiree, um, who 
just came to our lab about in July, learned how to, came to do electronics, actually recommended by Mo Hadden, picked up uh, video editing skills, made this lovely, amazing video about what happens when survivors go back home mm -hmm. in Creo and having and helping with integration for young people. So things like that. And now they're currently working on designing their own personal protective equipment. They're gonna be multiple other challenges that we give them. That's awesome. So, and, and I know you do a lot of traveling associated with the work that you do. Um, and, and I know that it's probably not that easy traveling on a Sierra Leonean passport. Um, as a public figure, I don't know that folks always sort of see the private side of your experiences. Is that something you wanna talk about at all? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't share it often, and thanks for asking. And, 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 but, but it's the reality that it's not always, oh, the Harvard-MIT grad who's sitting on a TED stage who has a TED talk. There's the part to where I, I, I arrived from Mexico just last week. Um, I was the last person on the flight because I had chosen to sit at the back so that I can sleep. I met two uh, C, uh, border customs patrol people waiting for me. At the, as I exited the plane, and they said, May we have your passport, please. Give them my passport, and said, you coming from Mexico? Yes, I come from Mexico, you know that. Um, and they did not tell me anything else, they start walking, I followed them, noticed that there were two other security guys standing there. We continue, and I say, it seems like I'm getting the VIP treatment today, I'm not even gonna stand in line. They didn't find it funny, so thank you for laughing. <laughs> But then went out to the front of the queue, confusion, confusion, put me in a room, sit me there for well over an hour and a half before somebody calls me up and say, you know why we're talking to you, right? Uh, I don't know. Is it because I have a Cerulean passport? Uh, we saw you left uh, Miami and went to Brazil and Mexico, yes? So that means you know that I was not in Sierra Leone for the last year and a half, <laughs> which is really unfortunate for me because I want to be there. But you know this fact and you still think you should bring me and sit me in this room to remind me about what the challenges are in my country, right? Um, things like that that we don't think about much impacts people's self-efficacy, impacts people's confidence, prevent us from going to help because we're worried about this victimization and we're worried about the challenges and, 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 and the, 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 the kind of institutionalized ways in which we cripple entire generations. We don't think about that and talk about that. So I'm happy you bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that must be a tremendously frustrating experience. So I'm glad that you shared. I think it's an indication of how much more work there needs to be done. Um, I want to um, turn our attention to a topic that I know gets you excited, which is music. Um, so you make rap music. You rap in both English and Creo, which is a language spoken in Sierra Leone. And I think we're actually going to play a slice of one song now. It's called Online. So can we play the music? Santa cool that's off. Just drank a few beers, this won't please the bears. Nine months ain't forever. No. But I see it's a soul day on my Twitter feed. I can't chat on my Facebook. No. And the dugouts is crazy like a dugout. I need peace at the good family dugout. Dug you need peace, you said for good dugout. Oh. Dug Let we go out. Check out check for one minute. minute. Uh -uh. They check out for five minutes. Too sweet. They check out for ten minutes. Too sweet. They check out for one hour. Check your Twitter, check your WhatsApp. I'm a lucky Facebook, do the book you. I like it, this one, he the follow me. I like it, that one, he do the book me. Check your Twitter, check your WhatsApp. Great, so, so this gives you a little flavor. Right, yeah, right, it's right. good, it's good, right? Right? I think. So how would you describe your music? So, you remember how I said I used to break rules? One of the things <laughs> that uh, I did uh, was when I was about, 9, 10, 11, I used to write and compete in rap battles, and, and my mom um, might not have known about all the times when I snuck out until 3 a.m. to cut to rap at uh, nightclubs. We won't tell her. But, uh, <laughs> but, but that is stuff that I did back then. And so it really is important for me that the music that I write and I'm part of um, does not use the N words or the F words, so it's not mis misogynistic. And I, I, I don't really feel like uh, I, I want people describing my experience for me, but it also must be good. It also must be something that we enjoy and dance to. Um, and so that's, those are the kind of things that drive my message. And this one about online was playing with this, being connected, being on WhatsApp and Facebook and Twitter, but also logging up and stuff like that.
Okay, awesome. So I think we're actually um, going to uh, close this discussion. You and, you and I have had some fun collaborating on some music, so we're going to close the discussion um, with our most recent song, which is called I Don't Go. Do you want to um, tell the audience what it's about? I guess it's apt, as we will be leaving. But I Don't Go is Creole, which means uh, I have left, I've gone, I'm going. Um, it's, it's about progress, it's about movement. It also touches between this complex world of one time being a PhD student at MIT, yet being race, racially abused in, say, a DC place or at the airports by the institutions we have. It's also about being present in America, yet having my heart in Sierra Leone, um, which is there to me, and this complexity um, of progress and movement anyway. Well, thank you for sharing a bit of your heart with us today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.